All right, everybody, welcome to another podcast that we have going on here. Chris Johnson's with me. Hey, Tom, how are you doing? Oh, uh, well, I mean, you know what? Uh, a little more volatile than we were at the beginning of the week here. So, you know, I got the banner across the bottom. Uh, topics I want to cover today in today's podcast is the Fed Watch. We'll talk about what happened with the Fed. More importantly, what the Fed didn't do. And of course, what the markets have been doing. I want your take on where you see things going and anything that you see in CJ land. Yep. Um, bond rates, you know, um, TLT made a new low this week. Yeah. And so I, I think that that's a reaction to not what the Fed did, but what the Fed said. We'll, we'll, we'll take a look at that. We'll take a look at the equity markets, too, and commodities. And, of course, I want to end this session by talking about something I call trading like a cat. <laughs> and uh, trading like a cat, I came up with it because just before I went on, the, we were coming on the podcast, my cat entered the room. My cat is in the house. My cat is in the in the recording studio right now. And I thought, oh, this guy's going to make a lot of noise because he's he's picking at things. Right. No, he's sacked out in the corner. He's done. You know, you know, cats. Sleep. Did your cat sleep like 16 hours a day? Dogs, too. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I always see them when they're awake. But most of the time when they're when you don't see them, you know, like this one, he, he's about I think he's like seven, 15, 17 pounds. He's big. Yeah, Ooh. he's over in the corner right now, just sacked out. And uh, I mean, with the fluff on him, he looks like he's twenty pounds. He looks like a... <laughs> <laughs> you know they they say a dog's life, right? I've never heard him say a cat's life, but it sounds sounds like living a cat's life wouldn't be that bad. Yeah, well, not in our not in this house. These cats <laughs> are treated like royalty over here. Eat better than I do. Um, yeah. All right, let's get to it. So um, earlier this week, the Fed decided not to raise rates, mm -hmm. and yet the market is acting like they did. What's going on? Well, uh, you know what? Jerome Powell's doing his job. I, everybody's complaining about Jerome Powell. You know, you, you turn on CNBC or you turn on Bloomberg, or you turn on anything and you hear them talk about, oh, this guy, this guy, this guy. This guy has been talking about longer, higher, or higher, longer for the last seven months, Tom. I mean, they have been showing their hand the entire time. And that's what the, he did yesterday. He said, sure, we've got a robust economy and it looks as though we could still have this soft landing, but we're still going to have some bumpiness along the way. And oh, by the way, the fact that oil and everything in the energy complex is heading higher, it's going to spark up a little bit of that headline inflation. And there was a lot of discussion yesterday about headline versus the core and him making sure that he points out that you know, we're focused on core inflation for the long run, but that energy popping up and that headline that can seep into the core. So the Fed basically told you exactly what they've been worried about, which is we could have a little bit of resurgence of inflation over the next six months or so. And they are prepared to raise rates one more time. Uh, and the market's been saying, nah, baby, nah, you're not going to do that. If you look at Fed fund futures right now, the next activity is going to be a lowering of rates, and it happens in, according to right now, Fed Fund Futures, it happens in July. So the 30th so we're going to be July. So, so you think, based on every, all the analysis you're doing, you think we'll be stuck with these high rates for a, another six to nine months? Tom, I think we're going to see higher rates for another 18 months. Um, you'll get a rate that will come down a little bit. Uh, maybe yeah. second half of next year, you'll see the Fed start to talk about lightening up on rates. But I think this is truly longer than everybody's expected. I think we're looking at up to two years where you're going to have something that's going to be between that four and three quarters to maybe above 5% for that long. Wow. Well, that's not going to bode well for uh, a reelection campaign. No. It's other not than, other than the fact I think the only positive way you could spend something like that is to say, well, your savings accounts are uh, going to have more money in them. Yeah, but, you yeah. know, you're, you're actually making a little bit of money. But I mean, what's one percent? Yeah. You know what? Let's let's point out because I got to point out if I as soon as I say that four and three quarters, you know, we're going to stay up there. There is one thing, as you know, that can bring rates down faster. Right. It's an economy that absolutely crashes. If we yeah. go into a recession and the Fed finds need to stimulate the economy now, right. that's where you get lower rates. But we don't want that outcome right now. I mean, that includes a lot of pain. 
I don't even see that outcome, honestly. I mean, I you know, know. here's some some news that I saw that came that came out. I mean, a lot of news stories that we could talk about. But um, one of them that I thought was interesting is that um, these big uh, commercial, uh, these big REITs, mm -hmm. uh, real estate investment trusts and companies that are in the business of buying inventory out there and renting it. They're having a hard time finding stuff to buy. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. you look at and and I have to go back locally and looking into Florida. You know, Florida's the the number one state for uh folks that are, are coming in. Uh and Florida has outpriced the average homeowner. They ju it just has. I mean, you take a look at the Miami area. You mm -hmm. take a look at Orlando, you look at Tampa. Uh oh. you know, um I don't know about Jacksonville. I don't know about Jacksonville, but those are your big four markets in Florida. And I know three of those four markets are wildly overpriced. Yeah, you guys are white uh, hot down there. Just a year, two years ago. So, yeah. you know, that right there is holding up the price of homes. It's holding up the the, the, the rent, uh, what rent's going for. Mm -hmm. um, and so far, people, at least here, are living with it because they're either A, I mean, here's another story that came out, that, pe that now um, more people are moving back in with their parents than mm -hmm. ever before. Uh, you know, they, they go to school, they go to college, they even have jobs, and yet they're moving back in with mom and dad. And here's the thing. They're liking it, CJ. They're liking it. You know why? why? What in the world do you have to like about moving back in with your mother and father? You know what the number one thing is? You're not spending money on yep. rent. Yep. You're not spending money on rent, and that puts a smile on people's faces. Now, I'm talking about singles. I'm not talking about, you know, <laughs> young married couples with kids. Right. I'm talking about the kids that you brought into this world are coming back into your world. Um, you know, the only baggage that, that I see them coming with is whatever they left to, for school with or whatever they left to, to, to find that job. But folks are really starting to look at local jobs and staying at home and banking that check. Um, right. And so what that means is that, yeah, you know, you think about that and say, well, that's going to, that's going to hurt. Um, that's going to hurt rent. That's going to hurt home uh, home purchases. It's not looking like it is right now. So, you know, you add some of these things together, and I think soft landing is still on the table. Mm -hmm. And so let me throw up, uh, let's do something we haven't done on this podcast in a long time. You know what that is, CJ? What's that? I'm going to throw up a screen. And my screen is going to be this one. So here we go. Look at that. Boom. There we go. All right. So what you're looking at here is the S&P 500. And the S&P 500, this is a 100-day chart that takes us from the lows that, that happened uh, back in May at 405 mm -hmm. to the highs that happened at 457. Look what's happened here. So you got a move to the downside that took us down to around the 435 level. We had a rally that came in. We did not make new highs. I really thought this was going to happen. I was in the camp, CJ that the Fed wasn't going to raise rates anymore mm -hmm. and that we were going to see ourselves in the new highs. And that still might happen by the end of the year. But you know what I think doesn't need to happen? Look what's happening. We're dropping back down again. We're sitting dangerously. We're right in that 430, 430, yeah. 435 sweet spot as we speak. We get below this 50% retracement level. That's a new low. That's that that all of a sudden it could become, a, you know, what a lot of contrarian traders call an ABC correction. Yep. And if that happens, we could correct down to about 425. We get below 425 and I start to get nervous about the fact that maybe uh, maybe we are indeed going to be pulling back a little bit more. But so far, everything that I see doesn't confirm this. Uh, seasonals don't confirm it. You know, we've we've gotten um, uh two really interesting days where the market has dropped off of the Fed announcement. Um, and typically we don't just, you know, especially uh, like, you know, like you said, we're not raising rates anymore. So everybody can now take a sigh of relief and say, all right, here's what we got to work with. This is what we got to work with in our budget. Um, there is one area that I think does cause concern and that is the bond market. Yep. Let's take a look at bonds real quick. You know, I talked about the bond market. I talked about TLT making new lows. Take a look at this. Now, this is a 100-day chart. This is, this is the iShares Barclays 20-Year Treasury ETF for those of you watching the podcast today and not listening to it. Those of you who are just listening to it, maybe you're trying to lay yourself off to sleep. Um, <laughs> let me just tell you this. 
this chart has been dropping for quite, quite some time now. Um, if we looked at, and let's just go back and look at 500 days. And let me just show you what we're talking about. We're talking about something that was at 155. Now, it's interesting because uh, back in 2022, we dropped all the way down to near 90. All right. Yep. Uh, we got down around 91, uh, uh, just around 91. Um, we're at that level right now. We're at that level right now because let's take the 30 day chart off. Let's just look at the, or the 500 day. Let's look at the last 30 days. And you can see here, this was the most recent low that occurred. Uh, this was back at the end of August. Well, we gapped through that today. Yeah. So what does this mean? This means rates just gapped higher. Uh, if you own SGOV, which I was talking about last month, yep, I have a, a, a pretty fair portion of my long-term investments in SGOV. That actually moves higher. Now, it moves higher every day. If you, you go back and look at some of the topics that I've had in past videos, you'll see uh, where I talk about SGOV as an income. It jumped a little bit uh, after yesterday. So it's actually paying an even higher income or projected to pay an even higher income coming into this month than it did the, the last previous months. Um, so that's the second thing, higher interest rates. And you know what the third, this is what I think the third caveat is, CJ. The third caveat, I believe, is Q3 earnings. Oh, oh. Because this is going to be a big one. There's going to be some surprises there based on that TLT chart and uh, you know higher borrowing costs. What do you think? Well, you know what they always say, first of all, go by. I, I'd be remiss if I didn't say the old bond market is the smartest money in the room, right? Yeah. I mean, that's those bond traders, you know, they are the smartest ones in the room typically. And they, you pointed it out in that chart. The TLT has been pointing at this weakness for a long time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're going to have some companies that are going to start mentioning that their capital is not as cheap as it was two years ago in the earnings report. I mean, remember, a lot, a lot of people forget that that is part of that margin that comes out, you know, your expenses, your, your interest. Um, I think it's going to be, I've been looking at the IWM, Tom, the small cap universe of stocks. So the S and P 600 is what I look at there or the Russell 2000, because those are the companies that are going to get hit the hardest with these. So a lot of retailers in those. And remember the retailers are, are always paying a little bit of a float because they pay that that finance on the uh, inventory that they're they turning over it every turns. two or three yep. months. Yep. So you are exactly right. I think that is going to be one of those. We've seen the last, what, four quarters. Uh, AI has been the, uh, the big buzzword during those conference calls. You know, 700 and some odd different mentions last quarter of AI. I think you're going to see the number of mentions of interest rate expense go up and how it's affecting companies' bottom lines. Do I think you're going to get warnings about it? No, I don't think you'll see warnings about it. But to go back to your what you said, this could be a, and we end up saying this, it feels like every quarter, but this earnings season could be a make or break earnings season. You've yeah. got the market that is going into that seasonal strong period that you and I've talked about. October is the comeback kid. November, December, boom. But you know what? What's that? Let's talk about let's talk about uh, uh, comebacks for a few minutes. Uh -huh. have, you seen, have you seen a chart of Nvidia since earnings? Yeah, oh, I'm yeah. gonna put that up right now. Yeah, coming to the stage, NVDA. Look there you go. Coming into earnings, how we floated up from the low 400s all the way up to five. We hit 500 the day after uh, the earnings announcement because the earnings come after the close. Yep. So it had this big pop up. And then the drop, they tried to revive it back at the beginning of September. Look where it is now. Yeah. We're back down to the low 400s. How about that? Is the, does this become a buy, in your, in your opinion? Does this become a buy if we do go into the holiday buying frenzy and we do go into seasonality and we go into, um, you know, get past Q3? I mean, because Q3 is... For, for NVIDIA, Q3 comes right before Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I know a lot of people that are going to be holding on to their turkey legs <laughs> before, before, before this earnings announcement because they may not be stuffing their faces. Uh, you may, yeah, you may be pulling back on your uh, Thanksgiving dinner spend, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I mean, that's just crazy. The, yeah. the, you know, I don't think anybody thought that after that blowout, absolutely shell shocking earnings uh, report they had, that this thing was going to be 20% lower. You mentioned the word contrarian just a couple minutes ago. This is the poster child for the contrarian trade right now. When we went into that earnings report, everybody had called their mother, their uncle, their aunt, their step, everything. You know, everybody was on alert and everybody was buying NVIDIA. Does it mean it's a bad company that it's going down? No. You and I both know, Tom, we've been doing the sentiment, watching sentiment for more than 20 years, the two of us. And for well, 40 years, if you put them together. It's actually more than that when you put them together, but I'm not going to go into those numbers. But mm -hmm. you avoid the stocks that are the most loved. I mean, sometimes it is as simple as that. You and I have been talking about Intel and how Intel has been lighting it up. And it's just pulled back to its 50-day moving average. 35 bucks looks really strong for Intel. I'm going to mm -hmm. start loading that up in my long term. I'm going to buy leaps on it. But it's an underloved stock. Versus yeah. NVIDIA, which is just overloved. NVIDIA will go up. So, man, I pulled the 100 day chart. Mm -hmm. I took it out in the 30 day realm and I pulled the 100 day chart. And you can see some really good support Look at that. Levels, right? Just above 400. Uh, and this is this is back in and into June. Yep. And then you've got the beginning of August. And we're, we're kind of sitting right down there right now. So, if you're a big believer in long term on NVIDIA, uh, it's got to start looking pretty interesting right now around these $400 levels. Yep. So, I, you know, I mean, that was the first one that came to mind. Uh, here's, here's one more I want to sh share with you. So let me bring back the 30 day chart. And you mentioned it earlier, but USO, mm -hmm. is, I mean, you want to talk about something that just has some resiliency, uh, yep. double bottom down here, uh, I mean, a two day bottom at 71. And this is, we're, this is in a time when seasonally this thing should be going down, not up. Yep. But Correct. because of, uh, you know, because of uh, what's going on between, I mean, you could you could throw uh, a lot of news that's pushing this higher, like yes. no drilling uh, in uh, in the uh, in, in Alaska. Alaska. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, we've got continued problems going on in the Middle East. Uh, they're they're tightening the spigots, and all of this is just pushing the price of oil right back up again. To me, there's no greater tax to the public than the higher cost of goods and services. It's hit us in the food industry. Uh, the agriculture markets have just gone, you know, the price of food uh, and, and even certain foods has absolutely, absolutely gone out of control. And in the last month, it's hit us at the pumps. And it's hit us at the pumps by about 15% just since, just in the last month. I mean, a month ago, USO yeah. was down in the low 70s. Now it's in the low 80s. And you, and and if you go back even a couple months prior, you go back a little bit prior to that, and we were talking about USO at 62, and now it's, it, and it just bounced off of 82. So, I mean, figure out how that hits you in the pump. Yeah. It's, and this isn't. This isn't going anywhere but up, I think, because, you know, my biggest tell here, Tom, is all the airlines that came out last week and started saying energy. It's kind of like we were talking about with interest rates. Uh, energy prices are now hitting their margins and they're starting to downgrade their outlook. They're starting to say they expect to have fewer bookings in 2024, and mm -hmm. it all comes down to energy. There is no, I, there are a couple businesses that are just in tune with energy and the long term trends there. But the airline industry, they've got the real pros out there hedging those energy costs. And if they're worried about higher energy uh, hitting their bottom line, that tells you that those prices are there to stay. We're not going to yeah. see oil roll back over and head down. So, yeah, this is one of the few charts that, that we've looked at that is making new highs for the year. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else that you could think of right off the bat of something, either it is a stock or it is a sector that's making new highs outside of energy? Uh, no, the discretionaries are sticking in there. They're trying to hang in for the fight. Um, but even they're starting to wane off now that housing companies are, uh, you know, the, the housing sector is starting to uh, pull back. So yeah. no, the list of new highs is, is growing even smaller now. Okay. All right. Hey, you're an option trader. I'm an option trader. 
I'm sure you're wondering because I didn't tell you this trading like a cat. Yes. Because I, you wanted I'm to curious. talk about this before we got on the podcast. And I said, no, we'll talk about it during the podcast. Yeah. But like I said, my cat hasn't moved. It, 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 he, he looks like, I mean, I, I, oh, he's looking at me now. So he's, oh. he's, he's still alive. Watch yourself. <laughs> he's got this, he's got this on his back. Look, look. <laughs> But um, so when I talk about trading like a cat, I'm talking about about how we look at um, alternative investments, you know. And, and so for our, all of our podcasters who are watching us, you know, um, think about these two animals, a dog and a cat. A dog, the one thing I know about dogs is they have no concept of time. You can walk out the front door, come back in 10 minutes later. It's like you were gone for a month. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah. You're right. That's they, my they, dog. <laughs> they don't have a concept of time. So they really are like buying a stock because a stock, in essence, is really a, not a time instrument. Um, you know, you're, you're looking for uh, your stocks to go up in value. Um, and some people might have a time frame that may be years or even decades um, where, you know, uh, if you look at a dog and a cat in the same room um, – and this guy, Mike, who used to, uh, you know, used to work with me in the past, used to re refer to he had a dog and a cat. And he said, it's funny because the cat would jump up on a bookshelf okay. or high uh, up high. The dog had no idea where the cat went because the dog's perception, the dog's eye perception was pretty much level with the height of the, of the you know, how, how tall he was. Uh, and he said, my cat would look down at my dog. And my cat could see three dimensionally. My cat could see everything going on in the room where a dog kind of sees what's going on right in front of him. Uh -huh. uh, so, uh, you know, he said, I, I trade options like a kind of like a cat three dimensionally and a three and, and the difference between a one dimensional trader and a three dimensional trader is a one dimensional trader really is only a stock trader where a three dimensional trader looks at options and not only look at options, uh, you know, but not like a novice. Mm -hmm. meaning there are actually three dimensions to an option trader. There's price, there's time, and there's volatility. When I first got trading, started trading in options, um, I was working for a home improvement company, the mm -hmm. largest one in the world. And I would buy options on that company as it was heading into earnings because it was always about price to me. The price of that stock was much higher after earnings. Now, lo and behold, I didn't realize this wasn't going to be something that was going to last forever. It happened for a few quarters, and then all of a sudden, it didn't react the same way it did. And I was losing money on call options, even when the stock wasn't going anywhere. Mm -hmm. And so that's the second dimension. It's time, and, it's, uh, and it is, you know, I was running out of time. Those of you that, are, that have traded options that are new, and you wonder, how come I'm losing money on my option price when the stock is, is uh, going in the same direction, hasn't moved? Um, and that is because that if you're a buyer of options, time ticks away from you. Yep. And then there's that third dimension, which is volatility. And volatility, the best way I can explain volatility is typically volatility goes up and down either if the overall market is screaming up or screaming down, or if stock that you have a call option in question is going through an event like an mm -hmm. earnings report, where you'll see volatility is your friend before earnings and it is your enemy after earnings. And so um, I, I wanted to bring that up and, and th th that, you know, if you want to learn the, this business outside of long-term investing, then you need to learn how to trade like a cat, meaning you need to think about three there different we go. price, time, volatility. I like that. I like That's that. That's my message. Yeah. There you the go. Day. I like that a lot. All right. Well, CJ, thanks for hanging out with me. I mean, next week's always, a, you know, next week's going to be an interesting week because, uh, you know, we're, we're coming into, um, uh, I don't know if it's the last full week of September. Uh, I believe it is. It yeah. is. Last full week of September. Um, the, the calendar starts to change. The seasonal calendar starts to change at the end of last, at the end of next week. So it's going to be interesting. You and I sitting in the room again having a conversation and seeing whether the market is lower next week or if we're starting to get the seasonal bounce that we've gotten in nine of the last 10 years. Yeah. This is going to be an interesting one. This will, because we, we talk about, you know, it's self-fulfilling. The seasonality becomes self-fulfilling here. Yeah. And uh, this market should feel like it's ready to pull itself up by the bootstraps and start walking uh, through October. 
So we'll talk about it next week, folks. Uh, we'll see you again here, same time, same podcast, different information. Till then, have a great rest of your week and weekend, and we'll see you soon. Bye, everyone.